to the degree that you want something is the degree you're afraid of not having. Yeah. God, I wish I started when I was younger. I go, well, yeah, but you didn't. So shut the fuck up and let's <laughs> right. keep going. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nobody changes until they change their energy. And when you change your energy, you change your life. Because it's not till then that it's really real. Yeah. It's like, oh, this is way worse than I thought. It's like, oh, yeah, it's way, way worse than you thought. Yeah. But luckily, there's more to you than you think. Layla. Aubrey. Here we are. Yes. So we've crossed paths a bunch of times. I think one of the first times was at Burning Man when we were talking back to back and then went on a panel. And I was always really interested in everything you had to say and interested in following all your work. I mean, you're coaching so many thousands of people about sexuality and Tantra and everything. But really, it was a time after we had dinner in New York and we were sitting around on a rooftop and we started talking about everything. And you started telling some amazing stories. And for the first time in my life, I was like, oh, Tantra, I get it. And it was this fucking aha moment where I was like, oh, shit, I get it. Like, it's a word that I've kind of known about and just kind of like put in the side cabinet, like in the cupboard. And I was like, yeah, I'll open that cupboard some other time later. But then just talking to you for like 20 minutes, I was like, oh, wow. Like, I understand this whole thing now. I still haven't opened the cupboard myself <laughs> to actually practice it, but maybe after this podcast, I'll be even more inspired. And I've been really looking forward to this conversation. So thanks for so much for coming on. Absolutely. Yeah. So you have an interesting kind of story about how you kind of wound your way into this practice, right? Yeah. I mean, it started off, childhood wasn't your favorite thing. No. <laughs> and that's probably a pretty common story for most of us yeah i um i experienced uh, a lot of sexual abuse uh in childhood and was extremely shut down and also just incredibly lonely and alienated as many of us are and i actually grew up uh right next to columbine high school and so the oh, columbine wow. shootings happened when i was 14 in high school at the high school nearby so it wow. was just this kind of alienation and depression and addiction and sadness was also just a part of my um, environment when I was growing up, even though I grew up in an economically privileged uh, experience, it was, um, it felt very hollow. And for whatever reason, I don't know why, when I was 15, I found a trip in the back of the New York Times that was like a trip for high schoolers to go to Asia. And mm. I was like, mom and dad, like, you got to send me on this trip. Like, I have to go. And they were like, okay, if you do well in school. So like, bless my parents, they let me go. So a bunch of us teenagers got taken by two 20 year olds who seemed really old at the time. And in yeah. hindsight, I'm like, whoa, that's, that's like, a little sketch. That's super young. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> and so I got to go to Tibet, India, Nepal when I was 15. Wow. The first place I ever went actually was Kashmir, which is the birthplace of uh, great sweaters. Kashmir Shaivism, <laughs> which is one of the most developed tantric traditions. And okay. really when Tantra peaked in its philosophy and its practices and its power, actually, uh, Kashmir was really the home of it. And when was that in a historical timeline? That was about 1000 AD. 1000 AD. Yeah. All right. And something people don't really understand about Tantra is that it massively influenced and impacted all Asian religion. And so this idea, we're all one, that's at its core, a Tantric teaching that spread throughout the Asian subcontinent. So Tantra gave birth to Hatha Yoga. And a lot of the things that people kind of walk around saying is yogis, like we're all one and, you know, everything's the same and all of that. That is actually a Tantric teaching. But most of the practices that help people actually embody that as a reality have been removed from the tradition or forgotten in the way uh, that it is now even in India, but also in the United States. So it's like people say we're all one, but then you have to wear all white because like the other colors don't work or like we're all one, but like yeah, you yeah. shouldn't have sex because like it's, that's super <laughs> low vibrate. It's know? all God, but yeah. don't wear red. Yeah, yeah. And, don't, don't not... swear, and definitely don't eat meat, you know? Yeah, exactly. And like, so it's interesting that this tradition that birthed this like massive teaching has also become so distorted and misunderstood. 
I think a lot of people probably think Tantra, sex, sex, Kama Sutra, whatever, Kama Sutra, Tantra, same thing. Totally different things. Yes. Like vastly different. How would you, as someone who's been working in this field, just for people listening who have that same kind of predisposition to lump those things in the same category, how would you describe the difference between the two? So Kama Sutra was like the like super old school, like women's magazine, like women's <laughs> health magazine or like men's health or whatever. Yeah. Like, you know, this is how you do it. You want to have a nice genital fit. Like you want to bite them light on the ear, you know, it was <laughs> it's like ten, yeah, 10 steps to having like this exquisite sexual experience. And Tantra is like, do you want to know yourself as God and every single thing in this universe as God? Are you ready for an initiation into the highest truths through absolutely every living experience? And here are the practical tools and initiations to get there. But what's interesting is they were birthed out of the same culture, which in ancient India, there was a respect for pleasure and mm. a path of pleasure as a path to spiritual realization, which is actually true in India, um, sorry, not in India, in Europe as well. I'm learning more and more about that. There was a teaching in uh, the Greek pagan traditions that ecstasy cleanses your soul. So this teaching that you need to go and have your soul cleansed was co-opted by the Christian church through confession. You have to go to a priest, but actually that was... Um, created on top of an ancient system of practices that said it was ecstatic liberation that cleansed your soul. And so the way to get to spirit and to have spiritual realization was through these wild, pleasure-filled, ecstatic practices. And so you'll also mm -hmm. see that in India at the time. And so there was this respect for pleasure and sexuality, which is where you get the same respect in Tantra and through the Kama Sutra. So that ancient Greek practice must have been like a subsect of the overall general kind of mindset because in my own studies of classical philosophy, ancient Greece was not the most reverent to women's pleasure or sexuality. I mean, I remember actually in some of my studies reading reports of how women in their menstruation the men would encourage them or the society at large would encourage them. It's one, one of the things they would have them do was put horse dung in their vagina and isolate themselves. And it was this very strange kind of culture of what we would call now like some kind of misogyny and some kind of repression of the women's sexuality in yeah. a weird way. But with that, there's also probably the counter movement as well. It, was that tied at all into this kind of Bacchanalia, I know that's the Russian word for it, but the, that kind of ecstatic celebrations that mm -hmm. you would find, was that all kind of woven in? Was there a deeper spiritual meaning to that? Which what, what we think now of is, it's, oh, that was just a crazy, crazy party. They used yeah. to just drink wine and have sex and dance under the <laughs> moonlight. But, but was there a spiritual undercurrent to some of that as well? Absolutely. And so the, there's a lot of pieces here. One is, you know, we forget that patriarchy is 5,000 years old, you know, and- At minimum. At minimum, <laughs> at minimum, yeah. you know, and racism for all of the hell that that's created is only a few hundred years old as a systematic way of oppressing a people. And at minimum also. At minimum also. <laughs> right. And so it's kind of mind blowing to really think that, you know, we don't even know what women are like or men are like independent of this specific conditioning and in a way repression of the human soul. Because I feel like it's a repression to be repressed and it's a repression to be the oppressor. And it's, it's like one of the things I'm tasting through these practices is like, whoa, like what is pussy? What is sex? What is like, what is it to be human outside of this? Like really what it feels like is like one of those like spells where like, you know, in um, Lord of the Rings where like the king's like, oh, like crusty and old and, yeah, his head. and like, yeah, he's like yeah, yeah. just gone because he's under the spell. I feel like that's what patriarchy has done. And patriarchy isn't like all men are evil or anything. It's just a systematic way of oppressing women and treating them as second class citizens and denying them social, economic and spiritual power. But that impacts everything. So the interesting thing is you can have these very uh, 
ecstatic pleasure rituals and still be very anti-woman, right? Uh, they worship the goddess in India and treat women like shit, right? And they worshiped the goddess in ancient Greece and treated women like shit. So it doesn't necessarily go hand in hand. And we forget sometimes that even men got their relationship to the sacredness of sex and the sacredness of ecstasy and the sacredness of pleasure stamped out globally. But that used to be a divine access for men as well. Yeah, it's, I think it's that's an important distinction to recognize that that's an institutionalism. It's a cultural conditioning that's not as much about the people participating because we're all conditioned to so many things. Like we can be conditioned to consumerism, mm -hmm. right? And just buy into it mindlessly just as someone can be bought into patriarchy but not really be a bad person. It's just like, well, this is the fucking way it is. Totally. You know, and so it's the power of conditioning is so strong that you know it, it, you can't really villainize the person you can villainize the system it would be like villainizing the soldiers that go off to war it's not the soldiers that go off to war it's probably the ideas behind war itself yeah. which have just been adopted by largely as i've met many servicemen and women heroes that yeah. are trying to do their best but just something has been co-opted in the institutionalization of it that's made it a little bit misguided and i think that's a, a great distinction that you make yeah. but where do you think because we don't see these kind of like if you go to some of the more indigenous cultures, especially in some of the warmer climates, you know, the goddess was worshipped kind of continuously. Yeah. Fertility. And, and there was a whole different bent to it where you just didn't see the taste of it. Where do you think in history, where was that impulse that came from? Where was because it has to come from fear, right? Yeah. So where was that fear? What was the fear of women that kind of came through and created these institutions? Well, I mean, some of the theories, I haven't studied this particular thing. I study like, how do you unlock the like magic sure, and mystery sure, of our sure. sexual energy? Yeah, of course. But, we're you know, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. The we're just trying to set really the stage. Up in that. <laughs> we're going to try and set the stage first, you know, <laughs> give it some long form context. So, I mean, most theories uh, are around agriculture and the rise of private property. Mm. So when you have communal based tribal systems where things aren't owned there's no sense of who the father is specifically you all own everything together and you all raise children together there's less of a reason to want to own or control a female and as soon as you have a sense this is my land these are my children i need to know that i'm the father of these children so i can pass on my stored wealth stored wealth to them right. and that woman because women are slutty by nature and love sex and want and that's actually verified by science that's now. verified by science right? like yeah. you can read wednesday martin's book you can listen to whitney and wednesday's podcast yeah. and you'll <laughs> you'll see that this is actually and it's not you know slutty is just a, a way that you can reclaim that yes. word but it's actual sexual boredom for women comes a lot faster and a lot steeper than it does for men. That's in the aggregate, just true. Exactly. Women are DTF just as much, if not more <laughs> so than men, backed by science. Yeah. And so there's, you know, a lot of theories that suddenly there just became this really intense need to control female sexuality. And then eventually, once you've done that, why not control and treat them like objects and, you know, use them in the way that you see fit? It seems psychologically, though, that there is probably so that makes some logical sense as far as like the hereditary pass it on to your sons yeah. your sons carry the name your sons carry the property and that creates some kind of in institutional motivation behind the patriarchal system but there's more i think there's more yeah. there's there's fear there's, there's fear, fear. there's fear and yeah. is it jealousy is it jealousy of a woman sleeping with someone that's just this kind of innate thing or is it fear of what a powerful woman actually can do yeah and a fear of like because you look even as as the religions progressed and you looked at these witch hunts yeah which was finding kind of the the wisest smartest most intuitive you know women who worked with plants and women who could sense things that men couldn't figure out with their logical mind perhaps and maybe that was just so intimidating and so frightening i like, got oh, fuck that yeah you know like we know how to handle a sword we know how to get strong and anything else that threatens that you know let's just trying to keep that on the keep yeah. that repressed i mean i've thought about this i definitely saw something at the british museum that was really interesting in uh the african exhibit about like the men stole the women's magic and and then banned them 
from doing the magic themselves. Well, I don't think we did a very good job. We, I say we. It's not, I had no part in this. Absolutely, I do not. I do not take part in this. Stealing women's magic yeah. today, Aubrey. I'm just saying. No, I'm just saying that men did not do a very good job stealing it because I haven't seen like a long history of magical men, you know, who are tapping into that divine feminine. Yeah, that well, but we're that's now what seeing the priesthood the was supposed to be. Isn't that I, and crazy? And they failed. Yeah, they, I know that was a really failed exper- like experiment for sure. Um, I do, I, I, I don't know what that thing is. I don't know why that's there. And the one thing that I see over and over again that breaks my heart, and I loved this from Sex at Dawn. Um, it was one of my favorite passages that like, you know, the, the archaeologists went back and they were like, matriarchy never existed, but that's because they were looking for the opposite of patriarchy. They were looking for uh, if women yeah. are powerful, then they would have repressed men. They would have denied them power. And every matriarchal society they found where women were sexually, economically, and socially empowered, the men thrived. Because, And I even see this in my own life. When women get power, yes, there are exceptions to this, and they're like anchored in their pussies and their magic and their energy. It's like, I just want everyone to thrive, including the men. Like, Mm. I want us all to be having the most awesome life party of all time. And I think when you talk about, you know, patriarchy is not about shaming individuals. It's about, you know, looking at a system and saying, what's the cause and effect? The question that I would love to ask men, especially, because I think women have a taste of this, although it's an important question for women as well. But who would you get to be if you undid that conditioning of patriarchy? Mm. Like, what kind of magic and power would you get to carry if you weren't subtly imprinted with this narrative that controls so much of our reality. And what's interesting is, yes, we've undone some of this, like women can't be CEOs or like, you know, we still haven't undone fully women can't be president in the United States, but you know, like it's some of those things, close. Yeah. but like even sexually, there's so much there to unpack. And so much when you take off this condition narrative of sex being about ego or sex being about taking and getting like really just look at what is it for sexual energy to meet what is it to come it like really in the deepest possible intimacy and experience the divine together when you look into each other's eyes there's something so fucking magical about that that it doesn't make its way through patriarchy you have to get out of that conditioning just enough to taste it and so it's still i feel like we're just on the the verge of starting to explore what sex can look like without that whole history bearing down on our genitals which is like such a bummer. oh yeah yeah <laughs> for sure and i think it's also an important thing to recognize that a female can just as much be the leader of a patriarchy as much as a man could potentially be the leader of a matriarchy, right? Like we're talking about polarities, not about necessarily genders here. Yeah. You know, it's like I could imagine like Hillary Clinton coming in and becoming president and genetically she was a woman, but I have no no instinct that she would have changed any of the patriarchal tendencies mm. of that kind of leadership role, right? It just didn't seem, who knows, right? I don't know her that well. It's not like my friend Hillary that I call up and have coffee with or something like that. But it seemed like that would have just carried on the same, mm. the same of the same, right? Mm. And so it's not so much about male or female. It's about what are the archetypes of divine feminine and divine masculine? And both are important and both are necessary. We've just been, the scales have been out of balance. Too many rocks have been loaded on the masculine aspect of expression for far too long. And so it's unwinding that. And that's permeated all the way, particularly through sexual expression. And I think especially the desert religions did a really good job loading a lot more rocks of shame upon (laughs) women's (laughs) sexuality. For sure. And, you know, oh. but even but even in like even in some of the Kama Sutra, like you'll look at it. And I remember there's one there's one pose as I was going through this Kama Sutra book and it was called the herd of cows. Mm. And it was just one man. And it was like obviously some kind of wealthy man. And he had a woman sitting on both thumbs, both big toes and sitting and riding him. So he had five women riding him. But I never really saw the five men on one woman Kama Sutra pose either, right? So there is even still some bias. Even though if you look at archaeological history, actually many men with one woman who was actually fertile and interested, and this is a, a case that Chris Ryan makes a, a mm. great case for in Sex mm. at Dawn, that was actually probably more common. Mm. But it was still coming from this men have the power and we have a lot of time. Like the Kama Sutra to me is kind of like, you know, cricket. The the sport cricket, it developed because a lot of times in the colonization, you had a lot of time with nothing to do. So it's like, let's make a sport that lasts three weeks 
And they were like, well, some people don't like sports. Let's have sex that we can do like all day. But it was still kind of coming slightly from this, like a little bit more of a masculine perspective slightly. But it had it had a nice, it had at least some kind of balance to yeah. it, which I think it, which was virtuous. But, um, but still not quite the same thing that Tantra is talking about and not the same thing that your work is talking about. Well, either. what's interesting for me, you know, I, I spent, I guess... Oh, I don't know, 17 years now studying Tantra, doing classical Tantra, went to Asia, spent 10 years on and off there. And and I love that tradition. And there's an interesting intersectionality of being a white woman and from the United States and studying these amazing Asian traditions and having such a reverence for the people who maintained them and maintained that lineage and maintained that wisdom. And I have a real respect for that because a lot of those traditions got wiped out in Europe. So this profound respect for the tradition. And as I did it more and more and more and more and got freer and freer and freer in my own body, and by no means am I totally free. I've got so much to work on still in myself but there was a moment when it flipped and I woke up even deeper like beyond the tradition and there was a sense of like oh wow like like even those traditions were written in patriarchy those mm -hmm. traditions are middle ages patriarchy which was pretty much I mean it wasn't completely global but at least in Europe and Asia and the Middle East there was quite a lot of it going on uh, everywhere. And we don't have any spiritual teachings, any that are not through the lens of patriarchy. We don't have any sexual teachings that aren't through the lens of patriarchy. It's hard to even know what that is outside of it. And I've only had certain tastes of it, but it's like so ecstatic and so liberating and so joy-filled and celebratory. And it's something that every human has the capacity for. And that's how I got even more and more interested in ancient Greek traditions and going as far back as the record will take you. Because I was like, wait, like if this is as far back as the tradition took me. And then there's more like mm -hmm. how far back does it go? And then maybe who cares how far back it goes? How alive can it get right now in right. this moment, which is such an interesting question as well. And that's exciting because now is a time where we can actually wipe the slate clean. The past is only the past as far as we bring it with us. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like all of that conditioning and everything, like we're free in a lot of extent, not maybe not from our own minds, yeah. maybe not from the judgment of other people on Instagram or the judgment of our parents or something. We're not free or from that. Our own that. physiology, our own, you know? Yeah, you know, like <laughs> the, the own stuff. But in actuality, yeah. we're pretty free. Yeah. You know, we're pretty free to actually create our own reality yeah. that we're doing. And I think that's, Really, it seems to me what you've really dedicated your work to do is like, no, 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 let's throw out all of this baggage and bullshit and all these words like slut and all these words of sh that we use to shame and categorize and put labels on things so that our ego can put it in one place or another place so we can feel comfortable with us. Let's fucking ditch all that and let's build something. Yeah. Let's build something that's like real and true from like the ground up without any of these biases. Yes. And I think sex is one of the places to understand the depth of conditioning in some ways, because for the most part, when people have sex, they're either masturbating completely on their own, they're totally in private, or they're with one other individual who sometimes is that their most trusted confidant in the whole world. Maybe not, but like that happens. And still people don't go into the bedroom and get free. Like you don't just take your conditioning off because you're not around other people anymore. Like the number of men who are scared of their own anus or prostate pleasure, the number of women who still carry, you know, shame around how their vulva looks or how they might smell, mm -hmm. you know, like, it's not like you can just be like, oh, I'm not around other people anymore. Let me like put my conditioning down. It, it comes with you in your body and your mind. And so I also think that's why it's so fascinating to have a personal sexual practice because it is one of the fastest ways to fully get, wow, what is this conditioning and what is it to wake up from conditioning? It's, it's sex is just a super highway for that. You're absolutely right. And it's actually, it reminds me, I just hosted an ecstatic dance yesterday. And one of the great teachings of ecstatic dance is just to allow your body to move in ways that you might be ashamed to make it move. Yeah. And for men, it's like, I always do the thing that men would be the most uncomfortable doing in demonstration with the lights on. Like you can move your hips like this and you can move your arms like this and it's fucking fine. Yeah. It's your body. Mm. Like, and, but, but we won't even do that stuff in practice. And I understand exactly what you're saying because it was maybe a month ago that I first actually put anything in my butt. Mm. And I talked about this recently on a podcast with Yay. Jason Ellis. 
I still haven't <laughs> found how to make that pleasurable, but, <laughs> but this, you know, I was having some prostate issues and I was reading online. I was like, all right, it's good to massage your prostate. And I was also thinking like, you know what? Like, it's just fucking silly. Yeah. It's just silly. This is my butthole. Totally. If I'm in private in my own home and I don't want to explore it, it's like having a locked room in my house that I don't go in. That's stupid. Plus like, the butthole is so amazing, you know? So it's <laughs> well, like the locked you know, room that's like the I, best room in the house. It's got the skylight <laughs> and the velvet couch. <laughs> I haven't found that yet. I found I found that to be amazing in, in my female partners. I revere a good butthole. But nonetheless, in my own self, but merely the, the merely the fact I got one of those little enjoy wands and I got in there and I was putting pressure on the prostate and that wasn't particularly pleasurable. It was yeah. outside of a sexual context, so I think perhaps you a sexual context. You have to be turned context... on for the prostate to feel good. Oh yeah, it's that's, so uncomfortable. That's, yeah, that's yeah. what that's what I hear. Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, like after I finished, I felt like freer. I yeah. was like, you know what? I went in there. You know, I moved that thing around. I pushed it in and out. You know, I didn't really particularly get a lot of sexual pleasure from it, but at least like I opened the door and totally. I, I'm okay. Yes. Like, look at me. Here I am just fine. Yeah. Actually better than I was before, you know, after going in there and doing that. And like that in itself was like a little victory. It was like doing that ecstatic dance move for the first time. We're like, well, I have to dance like this and I have to look like this and I have to be like this. I was like, nope, here I am with one leg up over the thing yeah. and, you know, lubing my own butthole up and like, here we go, everybody, you know, and, yeah. it, and it wasn't glorious and it wasn't wasn't the wasn't this great experience but it was great internally like psychically spiritually to be like okay like i'm not i'm not stressed about that totally i've tried to make peace with and this actually is part of the tantric tradition to go where you have the most taboo you have the most resistance or fear and like go right to the heart of it in the tantric tradition it's then to feel god consciousness through all of it right. uh, including in your asshole and like you know the work's not done until like god is in your asshole if you subscribe <laughs> to the belief that like meme someone make a <laughs> meme the work's not done until god is in your asshole <laughs> Because it's true, because the greatest so spiritual teachers, like Paul Selig, we were just in a weekend with him, like, God is not just in the sky, it's yeah. in the mud. He even writes in his book, channeling, God is in the feces, yeah. God is in everything, yeah. God is everywhere and everything. So anything that you cast in the shadows is a delusion, yeah. because in the shadows is God as well. So of course, yes, God is in your asshole. And that's where all these religions got it wrong. It's like, oh no, this is the devil's, this is the devil's landscape. What? What yeah. are you talking about? Yeah. It's all God. Well, because if you know God in your own asshole, you don't need anyone else to show you the way, you know? <laughs> yeah. So empowering. Yeah. Also, the other thing is, is it's like not just just in your asshole, like the asshole really is a portal to higher consciousness. Like when you really get in to asshole pleasure, it's like, you know, all these uh, uh, studies now on like the amazingness of plant medicine and uh -huh. how healing it is to have a mystical experience and how integrating it is for mental health and wellness. Like, like an amazing anal orgasm can take you all the way to the highest states of consciousness. It's like this super highway of activation. So why are we not using our assholes more, A, and B, <laughs> like we all carry shame in our bodies. Like I yeah. literally have never found anyone who doesn't have some sense of shame around some part of their body and it's the most intimate part of us. Why would we not feel the highest degree of comfort with the urethra or our pee or our menstrual blood or our anus? You know, it's like, is there anything closer to you that will be with you for your entire oh, no. life yeah, more than your right. asshole you so, just you just scared me though because you said urethra and i'm like don't you tell me i have to go sounding and put a rod in my urethra now to understand some higher no, that scares the it. shit out of me <laughs> that scares the shit out of me like that is terrifying to me putting something in my penis hole like i don't know i mean i just may just just surrender that level of consciousness if that's if that's required on the you don't have to path, penetrate it you okay okay <laughs> thank goodness you can just touch it lovingly <laughs> okay good all right so we're this shame thing i think is is something that's really easy to grasp and it's yeah. something that i grasp but the thing that blew my mind and that you've been hinting at is using these states of pleasure and ecstasy as actually a pathway to recognize divinity. And let me just couch this with my own experience of unicity, right? Yeah. So I've used the plants to find that, and particularly 5-MeO-DMT has been a way where I can feel that blistering unicity of all sound, all pleasure, all feeling, all everything, where it just consumes me and I laugh at the hilarity of all the distinctions we make when it's all one giant symphonal accord of God, all the feelings, all the expressions, and I've felt that. 
And the closest thing that I could use to describe it is that moment of the highest, most intense orgasm where the orgasm is screaming at you with so much pleasure that you're back to that same one sound, Mm. the one sound of unicity, which is the sound of God. It's everything where everything else falls away into and collapses into the unicity of what is in that experience, pleasure. Mm. And that was, and that was kind of what I started to understand through you. Like, oh, like sex can be kind of like this way to reach that unicity where everything is just the ecstasy and pleasure of life and creation itself. Yes. Yes. And my mind was just like. (laughs) (laughs) So as I've been like going deeper and deeper into it, it's felt very clear to me that meditation is the still form of sex and sex is the active form of meditation but what's interesting is meditation is accessing those states through stillness and silence and sex is accessing those states through energy so plant medicine is a very energetic way to Mm -hmm. access those states so sex to me is this entire realm that can be studied and activated and connected to as essentially a plant medicine journey or an active form of meditation and it's so interesting because it not only changes the whole understanding of sex and what to focus on and what's interesting and where to find the like gems and deepest experiences but i've also found that when people start uh having that understanding of sex a lot of the problems that they face and hang up some blockages start to melt away it's like they find their greatest sexual experiences and capacities the same as when you bring mindfulness to your life through meditation Mm -hmm. it starts to shift the whole quality of your life one of the lessons you learn from plant medicine is a deep lesson in surrender like the the deeper you go is how much you can surrender how much can you let go you know and even in a 5meo experience i'm not recommending that everybody take this path this is a this is a very it's a very intense medicine it Mm -hmm. comes from the comes from the toad probably most of you know it you've heard about it i'm not recommending that michael pollan himself who wrote the book how to change your mind and explored all the psychedelics had a very rough 5meo mm-hmm. experience and mm-hmm. it's not like this is a panacea that's always going to get you there mm-hmm. and really but one of the things and i think perhaps one of the reasons why maybe it's so good as a practice for me is that i've practiced surrender complete surrender and complete letting go of all of my mind, letting Mm -hmm. go of all of my judgment, letting go of all of my resistance. And that's how you reach these states of bliss through the plants. But in sexuality, it's hard to do that, especially if you're someone like me who has a ton of performance anxiety. Mm -hmm. And the anxiety comes from this idea that I have to please in a certain way or else I'm not really worthy of love or I'm not doing a good job. I'm just being it's so it's like it's difficult to surrender my mind to the experience and surrender whether my dick is perfectly hard or it gets a little soft or whatever and not go uh oh uh oh here it comes it's getting soft i'm gonna ruin it it's gonna be all over she's gonna hate me now oh man she's gonna tell all her girlfriends that aubrey's a fucking loser here it goes here like those things click on and that's the same as what will happen in a plant medicine ceremony when you start being in resistance yeah. of what you're experiencing yeah Yep. Well, it mirrors surrendering to life, right? Because if you want to surrender to life, usually what most people encounter is, oh my God, I'll end up a loser. I won't do anything (laughs) anymore. My business will fall apart. I won't make any money. Like, you know, if I surrender and I really at the core is this disbelief that we're magnificent without trying so hard. Like it's Ah, like- (sighs) We're magnificent without trying so hard. Let that sink in for a moment. (laughs) Because it's true. Yeah. And the more we try, typically the worse it gets in some areas. It's not about not doing, but trying and doing are different things. Yeah. You know, like I think it was Yoda that said, there is no try. There is do or do not. Is that (laughs) right, Ryan? You will follow Star Wars or something like that? (laughs) There is no try. There is do or do not. But the trying, there's this kind of striving, which usually comes from some place of scarcity. Yeah. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm not just doing. I'm not emanating from the essence of my being i'm trying i'm trying and i I have this outcome result that i'm looking for which is the orgasm of my woman or it's the it's the success of this thing or it's how many likes i get on this post it's try 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 no let me just do let me just emanate this thing and allow the results to be the results yes and just like when you first surrender in a plant medicine ceremony in life like you hit that vulnerable core of 
the material that you haven't wanted to face so far. Mm -hmm. And it requires persistence through that and an even deeper surrender to find that like deep magnificence within. And it's the same I find in sexuality that yes, being willing to surrender in sex, being willing to say, okay, I'm not going to make it about having an orgasm. I'm not going to make it about performance, or at least I'm going to do my best in just this one session. Um, and, you know, to get out of my head and into sensation, into a state of beingness, there's a, a lot of terror in that there's a lot of meeting like, oh, okay, I've actually felt scared of sex my whole life, or I feel so vulnerable right now, or I'm scared my partner hates me or whatever. There's all that like unconscious material that hasn't been addressed. But then underneath that, this state of surrender, which as I'm sure you've talked to your audience about, is not like not doing anything. Mm -hmm. It's allowing this much more potent, much more powerful expression that's so beyond your dominant mode network just running this habitual sense of self all the time and like stories and like have sex like this and like this and like make it turn out like this. Once that thing melts and this deeper part of your nervous system wakes up, oh, like the sexual experiences that come from that. Like, you know, I when I get to the heart of my work, I'm like, I don't want anyone to die without having that experience, yeah, right? you know? it's so magical and it's so beautiful and so yes it's like you know we're seeing like in mindfulness and plant medicine and breath work all these like paths to these amazing states and it's right there in sex and in your asshole and in all the fluids and all of that too which is so cool you know what's it, what's crazy to me is that sex has been one of the most pleasurable things in my entire life yeah and listening and actually reflecting and understanding through this lens I realize I've probably only scratched the surface of the potential of it because only for brief moments mm -hmm. have I really ever fully gotten out of my head yeah. and fully surrendered yeah. and fully been in a container expressed with a partner where we're like, hey, like erections don't matter, orgasms don't matter. No, there's no outcome, like the complete removal of outcome. Yeah. You know, which is exactly, again, going back to plant, is exactly what you want to do. You set your intention and then let it all go. Yeah. Like just completely let it go. Be in that situation where sex is coming from this situation where there's no watcher who's mm -hmm. constantly judging and saying, this is better than this. This level of hardness of your penis is better than this level of hardness. And this outcome is better than this outcome. I've, n I've never, I've never, I've never experienced that. Yeah. And I'm listening to you and I'm like, yeah. Like I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I'm fucking, at least I'm on, you know, like I'm 38, but you know, I got some time still. Like I gotta, I gotta see what that's all about at some point here. I mean, come on, man. Yeah. There's also an intimacy. That's like, like one of the things I've studied, cause I've been studying sex for so long. And then recently I've really been studying intimacy. And I actually think people are far more terrified of intimacy than they are of sex. And the, that sex is this invitation to such a potent intimacy without compensating or without performance. And also, you know, it's, it's transcend and include. So you learn to have sex like this and it's not like you never use a vibrator again or have a quick fuck or do whatever. Yeah. It's not you like you love. have to do go find God every time you want to, you know, no, have sex, no. <laughs> you know, like, but like for sure, you know that it's there. You have, like, you have that access and also it deepens every other experience you could ever have. Like once you've actually unlocked that door inside, it's like, you always know that it's there through every experience and that fundamentally changes it as well somehow. So what are the rituals and practices that, cause you're te you're, you're like, you know, boots on the ground, actually teaching people, yeah. you know, how to unlock this part of themselves. Yeah. So like, what is the process that someone goes, we've, we, I think we've done a good job covering the theory. Yeah. And I think the theory might be enough for people to be like, all right, I think I can try some of this stuff and that's great and go for it. But like you're, but you've, you know, dedicated yourself to the coaching practices and the actual how and the rituals and how you actually make this happen. So what's some of that look like? Yeah, definitely. Um, so that is using, I like to use uh, five different tools in the relationship to sex and body that really help transform. So the first is breath work. So combining intentional breath work practices with sexuality and with masturbation, actually. I feel like masturbation is this incredible opportunity to retrain and reprogram your body because every single time you orgasm, you're actually training your neuronal pathways to want to experience associated emotions uh, and beliefs and thoughts with 
orgasm. So people never really look at how do I masturbate and is that how I actually want to feel during sex? And that's not to shame anyone, but to really just bring the conversation in there of like, what is the impact? The same as diet. Like, how does it impact me when I eat certain foods? Yeah, neurons that fire together, wire together. And if you're, if you're anchoring yeah. all of these thoughts and yeah. all of these visual images and everything to this experience, you're gonna carve a deep groove. Exactly. And I'm then, there. Yeah. I'm there. You know, I've been carving <laughs> I've been carving that groove. I've been digging one more totally. backhoe of oh. dirt through this Grand Canyon of one type of way that I reach. I can't I don't even remember ever breathing once during a masturbation session. I, I'm I'm not convinced that I am or am not breathing. I assume I am, <laughs> but I've never actually thought about it for a moment. And I think probably most most people here are like that. Yeah. And I've unwound myself too. I did this deep groove of like, you know, fantasizing about a powerful man with like a younger woman or like the boss with the secretary or whatever. And like legs crossed and like just touching my clitoris in a circular motion or whatever. Uh -huh. Like, you know, and that I did that so many times that it was hard to orgasm in any other position. It was hard to be with a guy that I was really attracted to and in love with and orgasm without closing my eyes and having that same fantasy because because I had programmed my body over and over and over again to say, this is the fastest route to orgasm. This is the easiest route to orgasm. Your body loves what you have habituated it to do. It mm -hmm. feels safe in that. So it took a really long time to be like, okay, okay, my leg, gonna, my legs are open. <laughs> oh, yeah, yep, oh, yep, it's coming. You know, and then to be like, oh, I'm gonna fantasize, I'm gonna have an orgasm without that fucking patriarchal narrative. Damn yeah. it. No, no, I went back to it. You know, like it was, it was literally years of retraining my sure. body and not from a sense of like that's wrong or I shouldn't do that but sure. just a sense of like I want to be free Let's explore I don't want to eat one type of food my whole life I don't yeah. want to have the same fantasy my whole life and like feel like I have to orgasm in the exact same way I want you know neuroplasticity you know options inside of my brain and body so the breath work is so powerful it's okay. also so powerful because most of the time when people go into this performance, you know, they are operating from the dominant mode network inside of their nervous system and they're on autopilot and they're doing the same, you know, movements and the same thought patterns and the same kind of like light dissociation, um, even though you still feel a lot and it's missing out on this much deeper experience. It's the same as when you go into habit for anything and sure. you're just not fully there and the difference of how things taste and feel and all of that uh, when you actually uh, come alive. So I find that breath work one brings you alive. It actually shuts down cortical control mm -hmm. and makes it easier to step out of that controlling performance-based goal-oriented way of being. But the other thing that breathwork does is then it actually opens you up to deeper neural networks. So you have to be prepared if you're going to combine breathwork with masturbation or sex to change the narrative that sex is only about pleasure. Because as soon as you start opening up unfelt neural networks, you're going to feel what's really there inside of your sexuality. And so sometimes that's fear, sometimes that's shame, sometimes that's like orgiastic bliss, sometimes mm -hmm. that's more joy than you've ever known. So when I teach people to do breath work with sex, I'm also giving them the tools to be able to navigate that journey really intelligently or to hold themselves if you know trauma comes up because a lot of people have experienced sexual trauma sure. or what to do if you start crying, how to have those conversations with your lover. So there's this whole art to combining breath and then understanding how to navigate your own nervous system. But I'm so passionate about that. I'm like, we have this amazing body and system. We should have like an owner's manual, but like someone should tell us how yeah. to operate our nervous systems in a way to be able to optimize them. And very few people have that language or those tools. And I feel like that's so empowering to understand that. Yeah, how does the breath differ? Does it differ at all? And and what is what is a, an example of the type of breath? Because there's so many different types of breath work. There's the Kundalini type of breath work. There's the Wim Hof, who quite jokingly says, "Just get it in in and out of any hole you want as fast as you can." Yeah, right, totally. which has a very interesting <laughs> sexual connotation to it. I also, but and then there's also other kind of different breath holds and breath locks. Yes. But for a man who's masturbating, for a woman who's masturbating, or for a couple who's having sex, like. Is it the same type of breath work or do you do you vary it depending? Yeah. So I think the easiest and most accessible is just a deeper breath. So a deeper inhale, yeah, than you would normally do and a deeper exhale. Sometimes you can do circular breathing where you cut out the pause between inhale and exhale or exhale and inhale, but that lends itself to lovemaking because you can actually do those breaths. Whereas, you know, 
more power to people who do Wim Hof breathing during sex, but it's it's like a you know more advanced layer to be like, <gasps> <gasps> or like a breath of fire, you just like yeah, pass yeah, yeah. out on your lover, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> But those can be used. You can there is some those. kind of strange asphyxiation orgasm kind of thing that could go on from a long breath hold, I suppose. Yeah, totally. And like 5-MeO DMT, we're not telling anyone to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah. yeah. Do not David Carradine yourself <laughs> as you're trying as you're trying your breath work and practice here. But okay, so just deepening your breath. Deepening paying, your breath. And paying attention to that. Some Just some basic form of pranayama where you're actually... Exactly. Paying, are you actually, you know... And then Squeezing attention your... focused mm-hmm. on your genitals and combining with the other. So there's five tools. The second tool, which is mindfulness. So, the thing... But first, are you like, is there anything activation of like the, the Kundalini pathway, like squeezing the perineum as you're breathing? Is that, so is this that is part in, of it? You don't have to do that. Okay. Right? Like you could do that's that. Like if a, that's like a, you yeah, know, yeah. that's like when you're in yoga and they're like, and if you want to bind from here, you know, yeah, like, yeah. Add, so that's like another layer that you could start. Which if you really up. do, you're going to have a really intense <laughs> orgasm. So I'm yeah, always yeah. like, really? I'm here on like, you know, Venice Boulevard doing a yoga class. Like, do you want me to do that in class? Like, are you sure? Like, do you know what happens when people really do that? Cause you have an explosive cervical orgasm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's really interesting. I was just at Joe Dispenza's advanced workshop and he teaches that type of breath yeah. where you squeeze each through each of your chakras yeah. and then you blow and you poke through up into your pineal all the way and like roll your eyes up and squeeze. And it's, it's this is Kundalini practice, yeah. right? But he's yeah. teaching that breath work as a, you know, before you go into the deep meditation. And there was many women in the workshop who would start having orgasms. Yeah, absolutely. So just, just from that practice. Mm-hmm. And it was like popping off like popcorn yeah. like here and there. And he mentioned like, oh, look, there's going to be some people who are going to have an orgasm. Don't think that you need to, you know, and just yeah. let them have their space. But it's an interesting it's an interesting thing where you start to activate the energy centers in your body and then squeeze and draw that straight up through and blow it out the top of your head or pu- push it into your pineal, whatever your visualization technique would be. But yeah. step one is just prana, basic pranayama. Pay attention to your breath, breathe deep. Yeah. And if you want, maybe start playing around with drawing that energy up through your energy centers. Yes. Fair enough to say? Yes. So the like of the five tools, it's breathing, sounding, movement, mindfulness, and energy. Uh-huh. So you're combining both the mindfulness and the energy of like conscientiously moving the energy in a specific okay, way okay. and so even f- movement of yeah. like using your body in different yeah. ways. Okay. So let's go to step yeah. two before I, before I jump <laughs> ahead to the advanced breath Are we work. crushing it here with the like, <laughs> 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 let me put it all together. Yeah. Um, so yes. So that's just the breathing. And then yes, you have the option to include movement. So that can be pelvic floor holds that can be working with your perineum as a man that can be Also just working with liberated body movements. Like you were talking about an ecstatic dance. Like a lot of people are very controlled in the way that they move their bodies. And Mm -hmm. so undoing a lot of that systematic control on the body during sex is really powerful. So if you unwind that and let your body move, you can shake, you can, you know, be moving in ways that wouldn't, like you're not going to see them on you porn or whatever. Um, (laughs) Yet. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) If, if before I die, I hope that I'll make someone deep porn and then I will know you will that my know. mission is yeah, complete. you made it. Like people are like yeah. doing kundalini activations on you porn and everyone's getting the, so turned on. The top search on Yay. Pornhub today was kundalini awakening yes. breaths. Yeah, that'll be the day. So yes, you can do different movements like that. You can activate with different toys. Like in, you know, the Taoist tradition, there's different ways to move your penis, learn like very specific muscular movements with your anus, with your pelvic floor, all of that. Uh, With women, I work with the jade egg. So doing all kinds of different movements inside of the vaginal canal and learning to activate energy through the movement of the body and also just to get into that state. So if you're sitting there being like, if my body does something, it's going to be weird you're going to be holding yourself in a state of control, right? You can't get into sexual surrender if there's something your body could do that wouldn't be acceptable. And what's so fascinating is, you know, a woman's body specifically, this is true of men's as well, it's very true of women's bodies, in a state of spiritual sexual ecstasy is shaking, dripping in sweat, tongue out, really intense like guttural sounds. And what do we think of? like that kind of expression in our society, demonic Mm. or insane, right? Mm. 
And so it's actually not an accident. There was a systematic um, control of that kind of body movement and putting fear into people of that kind of expression. So, so many women as well have been pushed into this kind of, I need to look perfect and beautiful. And, you know, even the conditioned, like, it's okay to want to look hot. I want to look hot in the mainstream too. Like, it's not like there's anything wrong with that. But if that's the only way that you will allow yourself to express sexually, that's a huge two-dimensional repression of how you express sexually all the way down to your physiological core. And so you're actually repressing if you have to just look pretty all the time or you have to look kind of like you know pornographically sexy you're not going to let your body do what it needs to do to get to the highest states of ecstasy which are wild and unhinged and i mm. think raw and beautiful but we have to change our idea of what sexy and beautiful is to I, let ourselves yeah. get there i wonder if you know some of the motivation is like imagining a man who knows that a girl maybe they're a girl they're with or a girl they like is having that experience with another man but they don't think that they can get that woman to have that experience they're like fuck that that experience is demonic like that's not that's not even allowed like let's like let's repress that i i think so much of this probably came from just insecurity yeah and like jealousy or like i want that or maybe some weird ideas of that because i i mean to be really super vulnerable here myself like i remember when uh, my partner let me know that her other partner, I've been in a polyamorous relationship, her other partner could make her squirt on command. I was devastated. Yeah. I was devastated. I was like, but, well, I mean, that happens sometimes, but like anytime? Yeah. And I was like, he's like, yeah, he just looked it up on YouTube. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> you know what? I'm going to be bigger than that. I'm not going to go to YouTube. I'm not going to go to YouTube. I'm not going to look that up. I'm going to let her have that with him, you know? You didn't that's watch the bigger my female thing. ejaculation video? <laughs> that's, the, that's, the bigger, that's the bigger thing for me to do is just, you know, let them have that thing. I don't need to do it. And I paced around, I paced around, I paced around. It took me about two hours like YouTube. I'm going to make a girl squirt. Oh, it's like that. You go up and down instead of pulling forward. It's up and down. Oh, got it. <laughs> and like i was like you're you're stupid aubrey but here you go you learned how congratulations but i mean i should know how you know and it was just about having that sense of like humility and being mm. like no it's okay mm. you just didn't learn how to do that yeah. and now like you can and that's a, just a tool like that you can learn and figure it out but i think one of the things that i'm kind of pointing to is that that initial feeling of jealousy mm. that initial feeling of like oh man he's just fucking better than me yeah he can make her squirt whenever he wants he's got to be better than me no wonder fuck she's got to love him better than me she's never going to want to be with me he can make her squirt whenever she wants and all of these things come in my head well fortunately i don't have the that kind of idea of like i could never do that and this is something that should be banned and outlawed and how dare that exist. I mean, you know, if it was the Middle Ages before the YouTube, middle ages, then maybe yeah, you're just like, ages, you know, yeah. this equals burning, you know? <laughs> yeah, and that's how you deal with those feelings yeah. of insecurity and, and jealousy. But now in our age, it's just about like, just being like opening yourself up, spilling out your cup that says that I'm the greatest lover of all time and I have nothing left to learn and I've reached the level of mastery and here I am, whoop, whoop. Yeah. You know, and just being like, that's bullshit. Yeah. You're always gonna learn. There's always going to be things that you can explore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and to go back, this I, this brings up so much. I, and I and I want I want to go through all five stages. I know we're only in stage two. You talk about the jade egg, yeah, right. And that's and when you're doing that, that's classically what you would call a kegel, right? Where you're squeezing the jade egg. Is that is that exactly right, or is? Yeah. So so a kegel is squeezing the pelvic floor, and it was originally designed to prevent urinary incontinence in women. Um, so it's just one small move designed to strengthen your pelvic floor enough that you don't pee yourself when you don't mean to, which is totally fine. I still pee. Like I like do so much shade egg and I go to F45 and I'm like fucking doing the like whatever. I think I told you this actually the, um, what is that thing where you're spinning the rope? Jump rope. Jump rope. So I'm doing jump rope and I'm literally like last two minutes of class and like peeing myself and it's like you can't pee yourself publicly and it's like you especially can't pee yourself publicly if you're like the pelvic floor queen and then I'm like wait shamelessness is my whole mission so I'm like jumping and jumping and jumping and like literally peeing my workout pants. And then the class is over and the bell dings and I'm like okay I proved my point I'm out of here. Like, but like, 
<laughs> so anyways, I also don't think you're an area incontinence. Like, yes, you want to train your pelvic floor so you could control being able to pee, but there also doesn't need to be so much shame around of it. Of course. But I think women are doing it for vaginal tightness, which is again, a performance thing or like or this way that like- <gasps> You don't want a tight vagina. You want a strong vagina. That's so right. different. Do you right, want a right. tight body when you're working out? No. no. But, but I think this is, the, I think if you asked most women, why am I kegeling? Yeah. It's a performance trick yeah. that they're doing for men Yes. because they, they think that this tight, because we have this kind of virginal idea like, yeah. oh, the untouched tight vagina is the best vagina. And if yeah. I can kegel enough, then I can squeeze and mimic that thing. But it's the, it's the wrong thing. Yes. Like we're doing maybe the right practice, but for the wrong reason. Exactly. Because also you, the, the thing with the tightness is it actually ends up being counter orgasmic because you don't always have to have pelvic floor contractions to have an orgasm, but it's often associated. And the stronger your pelvic floor contractions are, the stronger the orgasm is. So when you have a tight pelvic floor, you're actually, your muscles cannot flex enough to create the kind of pulsation that's required for a strong orgasm. So you're not looking for tight, you're looking for strong. And mm -hmm. that's where we also like again, like such a misunderstanding of what makes an amazing vagina. And, you know, if, even if women are like, well, I'm heterosexual and I want men to, you know, dig my pussy or whatever. It's like, <laughs> I really like have a man have sex with a tight pussy. It's going to be way less amazing than having sex with a toned, strong, well-connected, energetically sensitive, alive pussy. Like there's no comparison. I'm in. So yeah, you convinced me. I'm fucking <laughs> totally in. So the jade egg is, you know, it's a tool that you put up your vagina, and you're not just uh, doing basic kegels. You're doing so much more than that. There's so much different muscle definition uh -huh. work with different parts of the pelvic floor, and then you're also working with energy, emotion, integrating a lot of these pieces, doing breath work. Uh, so I like to say, you know, think of a kegel like going and doing one exercise at the gym, but the jade egg is like doing yoga. It's like crunches versus belly dancing. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Like. A you watch a belly dancer and they can move all different parts of their core and you're like, whoa, yes. how are you doing that? Multi-dimensional pussy. A multi-dimensional <laughs> pussy, yeah. All right, I got it. Okay, so that's that's step two. That's step two. Step three. Step three. So we're not going in like my, my particular order of a okay. Yeah, that, that's totally fine. <laughs> I, like, I, totally fu I totally fucked that up, but that's all right. We're going to try and get on track. It's completely my fault. <laughs> so then step three is mindfulness, which okay. is training yourself to be out of your thoughts, like meditating during sex. So you're not in your thoughts. You're not in your story. You're not in your fantasy. If you are having thoughts or story or fantasy, you're observing and just allowing. But more than anything else, you're retraining your focus to be on the sensations inside of your body inside of your genitals when you're making love and this is one of the biggest keys to surrender because what takes us out of surrender is that story and what puts us back in surrender is this anchoring into the sensational experience of what's going on during sex and so there's a lot of different mindfulness and meditation practices that I teach that basically retrain your body to be out of the story and into the experience and when you're doing that are you tapping into your experience or are you also tapping into your partner's experience or is it kind of a dual focus where you're just being aware of both and it, it's just kind of being aware of both sides of the dance. Yeah. So, you know, I, obviously the more sensitive you are, the more you can feel your partner. And I think also, you know, you can, you, you can shift your focus. Like if you're going to have the most incredible mind blowing experience of your life, it makes sense to put more focus on your body and your experience. Mm -hmm. But I think the real art to sex is being able to be partially in yours and partially in your partners. Yeah. And that makes it so much richer and more beautiful and more connected. So that's part of the mindfulness with sex as well, is being able to be in my experience, connected to your experience without having to hide, go into story or stay in my head. Because a lot of fantasizing and a lot of uh, being in our stories is actually to avoid the sensational experience of what's happening because that's terrifying for most people. So for men, usually the kind of, you know, and I can't make a, an entire gendered statement, but I found in the men that I've worked with Usually it's the loss of control that's the scariest and the loss of ability to be sure that they're going to deliver the sexual experience. Mm -hmm. And for women, a lot of the time, the staying in the head is actually a fear of their wild ecstasy and pleasure. So a lot of women have this story like they're broken sexually or they can't do that. That's only a very specific kind of woman. But most women actually are like so orgasmic, so pleasure filled, so lusty, so desirous. And there's so much fear built around 
around that, that there's a terror of actually feeling their bodies because that wakes up and there's been messaging their entire lives that that equals death, that equals slut shaming, being kicked out of your tribe, never being chosen, being crazy, getting an STD. Like there's all this conditioning around that sort of wild primal sexual unleashing for a woman. And I think the wild extends to so many other things. It extends to smell, it extends to hair, it extends to all of these other things that exist. Like, all right, no hair anywhere. That's essential if you're gonna be a a sexy woman and you shouldn't smell. And you shouldn't, and, and all of that stuff is nonsense, yeah. right? I think a man who's starts to become comfortable, and maybe I am on like the extreme polarity of this, but I love, I love that kind of wild expression. Yeah. I love like when the smells are strong, like yeah. when someone's been flying all day. Oh, that's the best. If I can get a, if I can get a lover that's coming off a transatlantic flight, and I'll get him before the shower. I'm Must like, oh, yeah. this is good. Don't you dare shower yet. We'll shoot shower later. Like we got, we got, we got things to do before the shower. And yeah. I think there's like a there's a magic to that. But that's also been shamed as well. Yeah. You know, and it's supposed to, oh, everything's supposed to be clean and everything's supposed to be in this kind of hygienic, sterilized version, not the wild, free version of what a woman's actual fullest expression mm-hmm. might look, smell, feel like yeah and for men there's a lot of deconstructing of the masculine narrative that to be you know an excellent lover in bed is to be perfectly in control to give her so many orgasms and to orgasm right on cue after you've had like a rock hard erection and lasted like the perfect amount of time Mm -hmm. you know and so there's this you know mindfulness in sex is doing exactly what you're talking about in the beginning of this podcast which is like like getting vulnerable enough to follow what your body wants to do and not your mind. Mm -hmm. And that's such a deeply surrendered state. And for a lot of guys, that's a huge reversal of their sexual conditioning. Yeah. I think the closest I've come is in, I give, I give massages and I'm Mm -hmm. not a trained masseuse or whatever, Mm -hmm. but I'll give it to, you know, lovers. I even give it to my male friends sometimes, you know, I'll give a massage. And I've found that the more I get out of my head and the more I trust what I feel and just trust that kind of knowing, like by far the better the massage output is for whoever I'm massaging. And I've explored that with lovers where, but it's mostly during oral sex where I'm like, Mm. all right, the the goal of this is an orgasm. The goal of this is just for me to connect with you and just try to really listen. Orgasm may be the result, but like try and really listen. It's hard though, because there's a certain point where you're like, ooh, they're close. They're yeah. close. If I just fucking power, if I go through, I'm gonna get it. You know, like it's like, a, I'm not saying like I'm great. I'm better with massage because there's yeah. no, there's no, you know, end point that I've trained myself towards. Mm. But then thinking about myself, it's like, Huh. I don't know. I mean, I can surrender also in a massage. I get a lot of body work done and I, mm. I'm very comfortable surrendering in a massage, but like completely surrendering when I'm receiving sexual pleasure mm. and just paying attention to my sensations. Not sure I've ever done that. Mm. Interesting though. So great, like great tip yeah. for people to just be really mindful. Yes. And then also when you develop that over time, then you don't have to do all the fancy like squeezes and sucks and all of that. You can just move energy with your mind. Yeah. Mastery level stuff. <laughs> All right. What else? What else on the path? All right. So then you've got sounding. Okay. So that's, sounding. And that's not sticking something in your urethra. That's the same name, but a different thing, right? No, that is step four. <laughs> oh, damn it. Urethra torture. <laughs> <laughs> Son of a It's the next it level <laughs> above F5 MEO DMT, you know? <laughs> Sticking a sharp, small object into your urethra and feeling God in the whole experience. <laughs> Are you ready, Aubrey Marcus? <laughs> no, no. I say no. So sounding is being willing to flow with whatever experience arises. So you're breathing, right? And you're taking down your everyday sense of control. You're uncovering lots of what's in there. You're opening up into a bigger, more expanded state of freedom. Then you're mindful. So you're really paying attention to all of the sensations and heightened pleasure and really anchoring into the experience of your body outside of story, outside of mind. And then what you're doing is you're actually um, being willing to uh, move with and express whatever comes up. 
So one of the ways to get stuck sexually is you do these opening tools and something comes up that you're not supposed to feel during sex. So I want to change the narrative from sex is only about pleasure to sex is about life, right? And if sex is an active form of meditation, you don't go into meditation and be like, I'm only going to feel pleasure in this meditation. Sure. Like that would be so controlling, right? Yeah. And you and would be missing work. the whole point. Yeah. yeah. So we go into sex and we say it's only about pleasure, whereas sex is this multidimensional experience that can bring up everything, right? It's more like a plant medicine journey. So the sounding allows you to welcome whatever comes, give it expression, move it through your body so you don't get stuck. And underneath that sounding, and I sort of work with this in more of the, the deeper coaching and processes that I do, is this acceptance of what it is and allowing to move it through and integrate with a loving, compassionate, present experience. So it's integrating that experience and it doesn't have to sit in the subconscious and control your reality anymore. So the sounding both allows whatever material is then arising from the tools to be integrated and to flow, but it also allows sex to be this big expression, right? And to not just be pleasure oriented. We all know that um, especially women sound during pleasure, but it's so important for men to as well if they want to learn to be multi-orgasmic. So so being willing to sound your experience as a man is one of the fastest routes to be able to control ejaculation and get into multi-orgasmic states. Okay, so more concrete examples of sounding. So sounding sounds like it could be some kind of emotional release. It could be some kind of moan. It could be yes. It could be really any variety. Can you give a few examples okay, of like yes. what a sounding experience would be like? Yeah, so like all of these tools are just like there's just so much in them. Okay. Yeah, of course. Okay, so... Initial sounding, like let's say stage one of sounding could be just sounding whatever's going on and that helps move energy and experience through your body. Also, if you feel numb, if you feel disconnected, if you're in your head, try sounding what you're feeling. Like an ohm or like what are we talking about? Like a ah. Okay, like just okay, sounding, okay. like yeah, actually out, opening consciously uh -huh. to sound, right? And then once you're doing that, so you're actually sounding, like let's say that I start to feel anger and we don't know why I'm feeling anger. I don't know. Maybe I'm still pissed off at my parents. Maybe I'm pissed off about something that happened okay. before. Maybe I'm pissed off at my lover. So instead of being like oh, anger, like I shouldn't feel anger during sex, I breathe into the anger. And the anger becomes orgasmic. And the anger actually mm -hmm. starts to flow as part of the sexual experience. So there's this willingness to breathe straight into the sensational experiences that I've cultivated a connection to through mindfulness and open into them through sound. And that sounding dimension gets you out of your everyday mind control and into a much deeper intimacy with whatever's going on inside your body. That's really interesting because that's a, the exact guidance that we would give in shamanic breath work or mm. we would give an ecstatic dance. Like whatever is coming up, yeah. like give voice yeah. to that thing. Yeah. Like if it's rage, if you want to yell, if you want to say, fuck you, you know, it's not, you're not directing that at anybody in particular, yeah. but you're just like letting out whatever is in there. Yeah. But you set the container yes. so that everybody knows like, okay, this is- Yeah, a, yeah. This you want to let your partner know. You want to yeah, you <laughs> let your partner know. Just like if you're in an ecstatic dance or yeah. in, a, in, in a shamanic breath work, you want to like let the whole room know like, hey, everybody, by the way, People, if you want to yell, there are other people who might be yelling, they might be laughing, they might be yes. doing all these things. And like, that's all sacred and blessed and perfect. Like, allow everybody to have that, that experience. Yes. And so it's the same with the sexual practice. Yeah. And you can give that to yourself. Like, if you're going to do the breath work and the mindfulness with masturbation and like, let yourself have that freedom of expression. But then, yes, that's a conversation you have with your lover. And literally just experimenting, like, what if the sexual session is not just about pleasure? What if the sexual session is we're going to sound whatever we feel? Cool. And we're going to remain totally in integrity with that. And it opens up so deeply the whole experience. Wow. Makes sense. And again, you're seeing the blending of all of these other consciousness modalities. And that's how sex becomes, like, the consciousness modality that it's ultimately capable of becoming yes cool yeah 
it, what is there? It, was there a fifth? Did we yes. cover it? Did we so blend then in? there's energy. So yes, we covered, we've covered four now. So then the last one is energy and that's starting to work with energy inside of your body. So, um, understanding how, when you move energy through the chakras, how that it, like shifts and changes the sexual experience, how to amplify different energies, how to bring energy into your heart. If you want to feel more in love with your partner, how to feel, bring energy to your third eye. You can have orgasms on the different chakras. You can, uh, basically rip refine and move your energy through your system and create more sublime, uh, meditative, silent sexual orgasms that are super profound. And, you know, just like doing a kundalini meditation can blast open your consciousness. You can do the same thing through sexuality with that kind of energy, or you can build primal energies and have like a really raw experience. So there's all these different things that you can do with energy that can amplify and shift the sexual experience and just learning to work with energy in general. Like you can work with earth energies, you can work with deity energies, you can, mm. there's like all of this arc archetypal energy that you can work with. And this is a huge thing to tap into as well, because like you're saying, women can have these energy orgasms. It's actually not that difficult to, to learn how to do. And once you learn that you can have an energy orgasm, it changes the whole story of sex because it's not just this friction based, my partner has to do something for me, but wow, like orgasm really is inside of my body mm. and I'm working to unlock it. So I think energy play, cause I'm like a huge energy nerd is one of the most fascinating pieces and also it keeps you know any long-term relationship amazing but especially if you're in a monogamous long-term relationship i find that energy play is so incredible because there's always something new to explore there's always something new to try what's very interesting is <clears throat> i was just recently we were in a sound healing concert with east forest mm. and whitney why don't you come up here Come up here. Come on. Come on in. Whitney. Whitney's, Whitney's coming on for a guest appearance. <laughs> Everybody, Whitney Miller, Yay. come on in. You're going to take the mic because because you experienced a spontaneous, your very first spontaneous energetic <laughs> orgasm. Yes. So I want you to, I want I you to, did. I want I you to. I had no idea what I looked like. I was very cozy on the couch. So I want you to, I want you to explain to, to explain what happened to Layla and then maybe Layla can help you understand what happened and then hopefully maybe give some guidance about how to do this, not just b so it happens on accident, but so it happens on purpose. Yeah. Yeah. It was really cool. So we were in this sound healing um, and I basically started to feel, get into like um, heart and mind coherence. And we were on, we were on a little bit of ketamine, by the way. Doctor, yeah. doctor prescribed. Prescribed. Doctor prescribed. <laughs> just so everybody knows. We weren't, we weren't just fooling around. This was doctor prescribed. Yeah. So I was, I started to feel my, um, my heartbeat just in my chest and yeah. like really giving that love in my, my heart and that chakra love. And then all of a sudden my legs started to pulse, yeah. you know, with my heart. And I've never really felt that. I've, I've felt like you can feel your heartbeat. You can feel like when it goes through your entire body, but this was solely focused on my legs. And I was like, wow, that's really interesting and fun and cool. And so then I started to do like some deeper breathing and then like yeah. building a little bit of the kundalini and like building because I, I felt like I was getting turned on. I yeah. was like, wow. And then I was getting really turned on. And my and my hand my he hands are behind my head and I'm completely still laying there and just like really building that energy and building that energy and building that energy to where I got to the point um of really close to orgasm. And then I kind of like relaxed it and I was like, wait a minute, let me see if I can do that again. Like what is going on? And so I did it again and I swear I brought myself to like a full energetic orgasm to where like he even felt me next to him and my body just was like, yes. like it like shuddered. And I was like, oh. Yeah, I felt her shudder. Wow. And I was like, oh, maybe she's just going through something or maybe she just got a shiver. <laughs> like I had no idea, but I was thinking about sex the whole time. I was but having that's... a good old time. <laughs> 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 and it was like right when Ramdas's voice hit through East Forest track, too, which was quite, <laughs> quite funny for me. Actually. So I'd never experienced that before, but I've heard of it and I've, yeah. you know, been interested in exploring that. But I and I didn't even go into that ceremony with the intention of exploring that. It just kind of like a, was there for me. Yes. So how and so that happened spontaneously. Yeah. You know, that's like those those things that sometimes happen spontaneously. But it seems like in your practice, you're able to help people cultivate that consciously. 
So you're talking about playing with energy. Energy was actually acting on Whitney in a way that created that reality. But how do you start to, and obviously it's probably, this is a year long course that you offer for this. Like, so I understand that you can't condense it all, but like, what are some of the ways that people can just start to consciously actually play with energy like that? Yeah. I mean, I do have like, I don't, I think it's like an eight minute YouTube video on how to give an energy (laughs) orgasm. So you could, you could do it in eight minutes (laughs) if you really wanted to. Um, so energy is inherently orgasmic and there I, I think the best way to understand it is that orgasm like orgasm energetically is the union of two different energies basically and that can happen internally so when you have a very strong kundalini activation or strong energy in general it's like you have enough energy to create that fusion inside of your own body and so when it's very sexual energy inside of your pelvis uh, or inside of your pussy or your penis your genitals you can actually move that energy through your body the same as when you're having sex and when it actually reaches through into your heart and your head it's a naturally orgasmic experience so it creates this kind of crescendo. And so I've actually changed the definition of orgasm from whatever you, it's interesting because the definition of orgasm is still like the contraction of the pelvic floor and the release of sexual energy as opposed to like this much deeper phenomenon. So that orgasm really is an increase in sensation accompanied with an expansion of some sort accompanied with a surrender of some sort. And so those three components are usually involved in any kind of orgasmic experience and you can generate that energetically inside of your own body. And do you use like imagination as like one of the tools? Do you imagine the energy or, and I understand the Kundalini practice of breathing the energy. Yeah. But like, so breath, imagination, contraction, but but I want to get curious about the imagination part. So you can do imagination. So like Whitney experienced, it will happen organically. So it doesn't actually require imagination to to happen, but you can enhance it. So like if I want to lay down on the floor and have an energy orgasm, if I'm not in a super heightened state, I will imagine the universe is fucking me. And there's actually like a pillar of light coming through my pussy, penetrating my whole spine up to the top of my head. And that will enhance it and make me far more orgasmic. So it's a, it's a visualization practice. It can be. It can be. That's one way. That's one way to actually utilize it. Because I've had powerful meditations visualizing the sacred silence meditation. You visualize like a warming light that starts at your toes and starts informing all the cells and moves through your body. And you can really feel it, like permeating your cells by using the visualization practice, the power of our mind or consciousness or whatever to call that forward. It seems like one of the ways that people could start playing with like energy. Yes, absolutely. So yes, you can. It's like as you're doing breath work, if you really um, want to work with this, you don't like in the energy orgasm practice that, for instance, I taught on YouTube and I used to teach a lot. All you actually have to do is just be breathing into your pelvis and feeling into that energy and allowing it to flow through you. And once you breathe and feel and you're out of your everyday mind reality enough and that energy moves, it's the same. It's like we think that sex is all about penetration and friction, but it was always about the energy. So all you're doing is feeling the energy of sex and orgasm moving through your body without the mind addiction that you needed to ever have anything physically happening in the first place. Yeah. When I was, I guess the visualization that I had, it was almost like in the, in the breathing, it was almost like stoking a fire, Yes, you know, and just like, and then I had this beautiful vision of my pussy turning into a lily like a fully bloomed lily and I was like wow it's so beautiful (laughs) and then yeah and then I had this energetic orgasm and now I'm fully into this I feel like it was very beautiful and healing it was almost like the music and and the mind and spirit and everything was just coming in to heal any maybe blockages that I had there or shame or fear insecurities that you know, so many of us have. Yeah. Oh, it's so beautiful. So yeah, I mean, everyone can learn to do it and it does help, um, especially in the beginning to visualize, to consciously build and grow that energy. That's where the breath work is really helpful if you're not taking doctor prescribed ketamine. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Because something to help you get out of the everyday reality is really useful for that. So like with the energy orgasm, um, 
like I used to do them as one-on-one sessions back in my like, you know, crazy jungle tantrika days. Um, And it would be like 45 minutes of breath to get someone opened up enough into a state where that was possible, like enough releasing of the everyday mind control. And then the energy will just move that way itself. It's so fascinating. And I really have started to experience that a lot of attraction is actually when you're an energetic match and someone can alchemically move your energy. And it's so fascinating because when I was in a physically monogamous relationship, it's like the, we used to agree that we could do energetically whatever we wanted with other people. And so I would literally, if I felt an overwhelming attraction to someone, I'd be like, do you just want to have an energy orgasm? Like we're going to sit across from each other and we're going to breathe and we're going to have an energy orgasm. We're going to let our energies fuck each other. And that's like some demolition man type of shit. Everyone you know? was always <laughs> like, like, sure. where you like just hook up to the VR thing and you just have sex that way. And what was crazy about all three of them is I was obsessed with them prior to doing that. Like obsessed, couldn't stop thinking about them so turned on by them would wake up and think about them after the energy orgasm fucking like it was like all of a sudden they were normal humans to me they weren't like these like deep obsessions anymore and i was like wow like how many marriages have been ruined by energy wanting to fucking move and nobody understands that that's all it's trying to do Mm. wow (laughs) wow 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 well thank you for your cameo whitney i appreciate (laughs) i I appreciate you coming in Coming in to deliver the deliver the factual accounting of an energy orgasm, slightly. Oh. <laughs> wow. So, and and the thing is, a lot of people might be thinking that this is inaccessible to them. Yeah. Like this is just not possible for you. Not possible. You know, uh, can a man have an energy orgasm? Absolutely. Wow. Yeah, and that's when men become way more multi orgasmic and way less. And mm. does cum come out when you when you have an energetic orgasm as a man? Uh. Uh-uh. No. So it's something else. Uh-huh. It's an orgasm. It's an orgasm. But it's not ejaculatory. Uh-uh. Uh-huh. So of course you can have as many yeah. as, yeah, there's, you're not rate limited by how much semen is in your balls. No. No. <laughs> then you can just keep going and going. And that's when like, you know, people are like eight hour sex. Like how do people have sex for that long or like an hour long orgasm? It's because energy is infinite. So it just keeps pulsating and pulsating and pulsating through your body. So when it's not a physical experience, it doesn't actually exhaust your nervous system. It feels more and more and more recharging. What's the difference between an energy orgasm for a man and ejaculation, which is a word that you can kind of, it gets thrown around now. Yeah. I'm very confused by who started the ejaculation word because (laughs) as I've as far as I knew it in the Taoist tradition, ejaculation is what you're not supposed to do because it means that all you did was push your semen up into your bladder uh, and ejaculated internally, which is How do you even do not that? semen retention at all. So if you push your million dollar point up in the perineum, okay, yeah, yeah. But you can stop af- it from coming out. You can stop it from coming out, but all you do is redirect it up into the bladder. So it's actually like a big no-no in the practice. But so I don't know who's been saying ejaculation everywhere because a lot of it's popular it's super popular yeah so i'm very confused but it's like feather in the cap type of popular thing like oh no i don't ejaculate i ejaculate bro oh right okay you know, i think that's really where it comes well, from isn't it's it like, funny that they might actually be totally wrong yeah <laughs> yeah i'm sure it is because of course they're doing it from this kind of egoic <laughs> tendency of like this oh i'm so spiritual i don't need to ejaculate oh you're still coming you know it's like someone driving an electric vehicle like oh your car runs on explosions that's cute <laughs> yeah you know mine runs off fucking bat- solar power <laughs> You know, like it's so much, so much more evolved than you, bro. It's a constant state of anal orgasm Uh, energetically. um, The million, you mentioned the million dollar spot. A lot of people don't even understand what that is. Mm -hmm. And this is from an ancient Taoist sex practice Mm -hmm. where if you push on a point in your perineum, you'll actually stop the release or you'll actually maybe... You you know better. What is what is what's happening when... I'm not going to explain it. What's happening when you push the million dollar spot? I've done it, but I don't know what's happening. So you're supposed to be stopping the ejaculation, but if you push it too late, all you're doing is redirecting the uh-huh. ejaculate. So you're trying to stop the spasm. You're trying to stop the spasm. So you're, what's happening when you're ejaculating is a muscle down there. Is it the perineum? Yes. So the perineum is spasming, yes. but if you push it down, it's unable to spasm, so you won't come. Right. So that's supposed to be like the like the hack version of 
how to stop ejaculation because right. the deeper version would actually be to be in such a state of control over your pelvic floor that you could contract your perineum without using a, your fingers yes, or your or you heel could relax it so much that it doesn't go into the fluttering so if you're if you stay in a parasympathetic state and you can actually induce that through breathing and through sounding and through surrender and relaxation and mindfulness then actually you can redirect the uh, orgasmic energy so that you don't get so turned on and feel like you have to ejaculate. So that's the way to actually control it more holistically and right. be able to orgasm without ejaculation. They called it, I, I read about it, they called it the million dollar spot because it comes from a legend in which somebody who is having difficulty prematurely ejaculating goes to a Taoist sex master yeah. and the Taoist sex master says, yeah, I'll tell you how to stop prematurely ejaculating. It's just going to cost you a million dollars. Well, it, that doesn't make any sense because I don't think there were even dollars back then and I don't think, but whatever, it's just a nice number that they could use. Also, but who wants to press your perineum while you're having sex? <laughs> well, I don't know. If, if you're fucking 15 seconds in and you're like, God, I gotta, I want to keep this going, you know? But again, it's probably <laughs> the wrong idea for the thing. It's this kind of manual thing. But I think what you're saying is we can learn to have control over those yeah. muscles and take, you know, take control of this thing that is out of our control. As soon as we yeah. like lose our shame and then start the practice, like everything, practice makes a master. Yeah. Really interesting. Really interesting. So you've taken people, you know, in your coaching, like through this whole process. So you've had people who are unaware, have patterned deep grooves in other ways, and mm -hmm. and you've seen them. And mm -hmm. I'm asking this as a question, and, and I'm I'm pretty confident in the answer, but you've seen them go from a deeply patterned state of one way of sexuality and then liberate themselves and open up to these other ideas. And probably that's the same story of what you did yourself, right? Totally, totally. I've worked with um, like 10,000 10, paying clients in my online courses and I definitely see um, all the time that everybody can do it. And so many people come to me who don't believe in energy, who've never meditated before, who really come because they feel broken inside or there's something so like wrong with their sexuality. And I'm like a last hope resort, you know, because they like went down some weird YouTube rabbit hole and ended up on my energy orgasm video. <laughs> um, so, and yes, though, it's, it's just as accessible from someone starting from there as it is, you know, it, for anyone really, if you're willing to do the work and willing to do the exploration, it's the same as like someone saying like plant medicine won't work on me, right? It's like, yeah. well, maybe your first ceremony or even your second, but at a certain point, like you're going to feel it, like <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, going to yeah. kick in and you're going <laughs> to, you yeah. know? So it's the same thing with the sexual practices. And I worked with all variety of people. I think one of my favorite experiences ever was actually working with like um, an Apple engineer. This was years ago. And he was like, look, I have money to burn. I'm here on vacation. I just want something weird to do. I don't believe in any of this. I actually think you might be full of shit, but I saw your poster and I was like, whatever, like, let's give it a whirl. And I was like, great, let's start with chakra breathing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. I, and he was like, are you fucking kidding me? I was like, yeah, if you want to do this, you're going to have to do it fully. And that's all I ask of you. And he was like, okay. And three sessions in, you know, during a breathwork experience, he had a full uh, energy activation, energy orgasm, was in tears and was just like, I wish like every business person on the planet could have this experience and know that this is possible. Wow. So it's so amazing that people can make such massive shifts and it also takes time and it's work and it's dedication and all the things. Well, before we wrap this up, I, I, I want to know, like, have you pondered what in a truly healthy, shame-free, balanced society, like how this would be taught and like where, like at what point, at what point would people start learning about this stuff? Like, yeah. like where would the instruction start to come from and how would it start, how would people start to familiarize not coming to this way late after having pattern yeah. these things, you know, these other ways so yeah. deeply? Well, it would just be so different to be even gestated in a mother's body who loved her own pussy, you know? Like oh, I love wow. the women who do my practices and they're like, I taught my baby to be at peace with pleasure and emotion because I did these practices while I was pregnant, you know, safely and with guidance and sure. all of that sort of thing. And 
that's always so amazing as well. Like, you know, babies touch themselves in utero. Babies touch themselves while they're breastfeeding. You know, even just having a mother that's not subconsciously telling you to stop pleasure and letting you feel the pleasure of your body as an infant, like that alone changes nervous systems and imprinting. So then, you know, being a young child and just being around parents, like you, your brain learns all the stories and all the patterns so young and then just runs that operating system over and over again. So when you're around people at the youngest ages who are ashamed of their own sexuality, who are living in fear, who don't experience energy, like what that does to your own programming is profound, right? So even that alone would be mind blowing. And then I think from a very young age and teaching things like boundaries and safety and consent and just the beauty of sexuality, you Mm -hmm. know, like that could start pretty young. Children are sexual beings and honoring them in that. And instead of trying to repress children's sexuality, actually straightening out the adults around them so they know how to create safe spaces for sexual children, that would be so, so, so important. And then, you know, just like a series of amazing, I mean, sex ed would be so cool. I actually did. If it was actually ed. ed. You know, if there was actually any education in there rather than just shame and control and like, you know, don't do this or you'll get pregnant and go blind. Yes, exactly. turn into a crackhead. This is the worst (laughs) example of an STD that we ever found on any human. And this is what could happen to you, you know, like, oh, totally. Um, I actually made a sex ed um, video recently for YouTube. That was like the sex ed you'd wish you'd had. And it was, it was all about that, like pleasure celebration and, you know, like healthy boundaries and the beauty of your body and teaching that women are as sexual as men, if not more so. And just like all these things and LGBTQ and like, you know, gender fluidity and oh, just like such a celebration of the human state, what would be possible? Wow. Well, we have to do more podcasts. I would love that. This is one of my favorite of all time. Aww. And I think there's so many areas just from knowing you, there's so many areas we haven't even explored, yeah. even outside the bounds of sexuality. Because as you've explored and sought these traditions that speak to deep spiritual truths, you've also gone down many different interesting rabbit holes we didn't that, even oh, get to I talk know, we about didn't even, we didn't even dark get down. Uh, <laughs> well that's a good segue <laughs> for the next podcast that we get to do which i can't wait to do with you awesome thank, thank you so, so much, much for this thank like you. this is you know so cool to, to understand that there's another pathway yeah. to a deep spiritual practice that i'm such a rookie in like i'm just so you know, so starting at the at the base floor level, mm-hmm. and then knowing that the ex- that's a, there's excitement there. Mm-hmm. There's excitement in realizing how much more I can learn, yeah. and I think all of us should be excited who are listening to this. Don't be ashamed that you haven't learned it yet. Like turn that into excitement yeah. because look at all the stuff you're going to get to learn, and look at what could be possible when you start engaging, and and if you're called to it, learning from this pathway. Yeah. And no one's really taught us this. So there's nothing to be ashamed of. It's just realizing if you have the hunger, there's so much available inside of this. And thank you so much for hosting this conversation. Yeah. It's an absolute joy to be able to share it. Absolutely. Uh, where should people find you? Obviously, you've pointed to your YouTube a bunch. It's a great way to get a bunch of resources. And then you coach people as well. What's that program? LaylaMartin.com. Uh-uh, so you uh-uh, can uh-uh, sign uh-uh. up with your email address. <laughs> I have some free Beautiful. things for you. <laughs> yeah, get them all. Get all those free things. <laughs> Ebooks and trainings and the like. <laughs> <laughs> amazing amazing well you're incredible thank you so much you're welcome yeah thank you everybody thank you everybody oh Goodbye. i'm so glad we had a whitney uh, whitney yeah, drop you, whitney, in you, for thank you whitney miller <laughs> yeah. if you enjoyed this video please make sure to subscribe also share with any friend that you think might benefit from it and lastly go to aubreymarcus.com sign up for my newsletter diary and you won't miss a thing